Hey, it is so good to be with you today. Um, gentlemen, just so you know, uh, they've asked me to set all the ladies straight today. First service thought that was a little funnier. <laughs> Uh, the reality is, we know I'm joking when I say that kind of stuff, but there are probably women in this room, moms in this room, who there's a little bit of sting when they hear words like that because of either someone else they've encountered or even in their own mind and heart the way they look at themselves. And today, as you will hear from a panel of women, of moms who are going to share with you about life, about their faith, and about what it is to be a mom, I want you to understand that when they share with you, they're sharing from the depths of their heart because sometimes it's easy when we start comparing ourselves to other people, to always assume that the other person has it all together, that they have it perfect. Social media is probably a curse to that very thought. Uh, some of you probably already this morning got onto your Facebook, your Instagram, Twitter, whatever the case would be, and you saw, sure enough, first thing to pop up on your feed was that perfect mom, or at least the one you think is perfect. She's the mom working full time and somehow has a way to have a three course meal on the table every night, and it's organic, and she is the one whose kids are like the perfect angels. All she's putting up is what they won and did and how sweet they are. And then you look at yours and you just go, huh. <laughs> and that mom is the one who's found a way to be volunteering in three different community organizations all at the same time while being a supermodel by knowing exactly how to hold that phone for her selfie so she always looks good. Moms, ladies, sometimes we compare ourselves to other people way too much, and when we do that, we then begin to enter into a realm of thinking we've got to put up some facade or some look or some image. But the only image you need to worry about is the fact that the Bible tells us that you were made in the image of Jesus. You were made in the image of the Almighty Creator, that He loves you so much, and maybe... Maybe if moms who are following Jesus especially would get more authentic in their walk and in who they are in their faith in being a mom and in just living life, then, then maybe, just maybe, you will give hope to some other moms who desperately need to see somebody who's trusting in Jesus as they walk out their, their life story. Authenticity matters. And it's different. It, it, authenticity is more than just having freedom to express yourself, because I think that's the way some people think when they think about being authentic. For a follower of Jesus, it, it takes it to a different level, because for a follower of Jesus, authenticity is mean that you will allow people to see into your brokenness so that they will see God's grace at work in your life. That's authenticity for a follower of Jesus. That's authenticity for moms in this room, and it'll be authenticity that you'll see on, on the moms we'll have in this panel in a, just a moment. But in Ephesians chapter, chapter 4, uh, Paul put it this way. He said, you were taught with regards to your former way of life to put, off, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self, created to be like God in, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for you are, we are all members of of one body. We gotta be authentic so that people can see the transformation that's going on in our lives from the old self to the new self, to what God is doing in our lives compared to what it was like before we knew him. And for moms, that takes on a whole new realm. For women, that takes on a whole new realm to allow other women to look into your life and to see the journey of an authentic follower of Jesus going from the old self on that journey of being transformed into the new person that God is at work making a beautiful creation out of. So if our ladies would come on up, they're going to join me up here. And in a moment, you're going to hear from them. You're going to hear them share from their heart. You're going to hear them share from their own journey. Now understand, authenticity also brings with it uniqueness. Because everybody has their own story. Everybody has their own journey. And as they share from well, their story, as they share from where they're at in the journey, there's a small chance some of you have looked at some of the people on these couches and you thought these were the perfect moms. Well, they're about to let you in on a little secret. <laughs> That's not much of a secret. But they're women who are following Jesus and are, are willing to share with us today how God has been walking out their journey of motherhood with them. Would you please welcome them this morning?
I'll like give you a moment to just meet them and to hear from them. So if we'll start over here on my right, your left, and uh, they'll share with you a little bit about who they are and, um, well, the uniqueness to their motherhood, motherhood input, that's, that's not good. <laughs> They're going to tell you about them and their uniqueness. Well, hello. My name is Angie Gifford, and uh, I'm married to Brian, and we've been married for almost 14 years. It'll be this uh, June. And um, I am an adoptive mom of our son, Alex, uh, who's three. And um, we've had him since birth, actually got to be a part of the process from about six weeks of pregnancy with the birth mom. Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I get to just love on him and be with him all day, which is my happiness. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sally Wood. Um, I've been married to my husband, Eric, for almost 12 years. We have three children together, an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. I'm one of the children's pastors here, and I'm also in nursing school right now, so we have a very busy, full life. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Anderson, and I've been married to my husband, Peter, for almost 15 years. We have two boys, Grant, who will be 11 next week, and Beckett, who is four and a half. And I, I'm also a full-time working mom. My name is Pam Anderson, and um, I've been married to my husband, Bob, for 45 years. Woo! I love that I always get applause for that. <laughs> and we have uh, three children and nine grandchildren, uh, eight grandsons, and our grand finale, Cora, our granddaughter. And there they are. They surprised me with that picture this morning. I hadn't seen it until now. <laughs> My name is Kathy Murley. Um, I am a single mom. Um, their dad left us when they were two, four, and six, and now they are 12, 14, and 17. And um, I'm a teacher as well. Um, and I just want to encourage those who, for every reason, um, may just be doing this motherhood by themselves um, that. I just want to be an encouragement to you that God will be with you um, no matter what the circumstance. Um, he's with you through this. She has great kids, too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Crystal White, and I am married to one of the guys here on staff. Um, he's the best-looking pastor. I'll let you decide uh, which one it is. We have been blessed with two girls, Olivia and Savannah. Olivia is 15, and Savannah is 14, and I, too, am a full-time working mom. All right. Well, uh, we are going to, well, we're going to have a little fun right here at the beginning, but we all know what it is to have something that your mom said to you when you were younger, and you probably said or thought, whether she said or did it, you were like, I will never do that with my kids. Well, we know that sometimes that doesn't quite play out to be true. So for some of you, you, you made those statements, you said you wouldn't do it, but now as you look in the mirror and look at the way you handle things or hear things, you hear your mom through your voice or your actions. Who's willing to let us in on that? Um, well, you know, I'm a mom of, of young kids right now, and they fight a lot. <laughs> And I am also the youngest of four in my family, and I guess we fought a lot too. But I didn't think it was as, as, as bad as it was. My mom was always getting after us, telling us to stop arguing, get along, can't you just get along? And we're just playing, it's fine. But now that I'm a mom whose kids argue, it is like nails on a chalkboard, and you're constantly waging peace in the home, and I just... Would like to take this moment to tell my mom I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I grew up in the day and age where my mom would look at me and go, I hope you have 10 of you. <laughs> and at the time, I thought that would be really cool. I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, but now, as we are in the middle of our teenage years with our girls and stuff, I look at them and go, you are my curse. <laughs> because you are exactly like me. So, um, thanks, Mom. Your prayers were answered. <laughs> I know one thing my mom uh, said growing up, and I heard it so much, is when we would ask, you know, my parents something, and 
I'd be like, well, why if it didn't get the answer I wanted? And she'd be like, because I said so. I'm like, that's not a reason. Give me a reason. <laughs> and I'm like, I told her, I'm like, I am never going to do that to my child. I will give them a reason. And now that I have a three-year-old, constantly hearing myself, because I said so, that's all you need, just do it. <laughs> so you, I am my mom. <laughs> there is a great quote uh, by author Jill Briscoe, and she, said, she puts it this way. She says, there is an art to leaving some things undone so that the greater things can be done. When you look at your life, what are some of the things that you've allowed to become undone so that greater things can be done? And maybe identify both. What, what did you let go undone so that this thing could happen? I'll start on that one. Um, I like to refer to myself as a perfectionist in recovery. <laughs> um, and I have to kind of give it to God, and I tend to take it back, and I do that frequently. Um, and so I think it's important as, as moms and parents in general that we remind ourselves that it's okay to not be perfect. Um, and it is a, a constant battle for me to go to bed with dishes in the sink. Um, and I want everything to be in order prior to that. But I've also learned that um, everything's never going to be done. And spending time with my kids, I have blinked and I have an 11-year-old. I don't really know how that's happened. Um, and so I look back and I have to remind myself, which makes me sad, really, to spend time with my kids. And um, a few weeks ago, my four-year-old asked me to play Peppa Pig. And so we laid in the floor and played Peppa Pig. And that will mean so much more to him one day than if the dishes were done or the house was picked up. And um, I was laughing in first service that they probably found the picture, but um, that a couple of weeks ago, I do a morning devotional with some friends, and I took the, it's a Facebook Live, and so I screenshotted my house in the moment, because I knew they would all appreciate how awful it looked. <laughs> um, you couldn't really see counter space in my kitchen or on the table at all, and I knew it floored a lot of them that I did it, but for me, um, that's a huge improvement, <laughs> um, because I was the person that I'm like, oh, I don't want anyone to come over right now. They, they might think I'm not perfect, and like Keith said, when we got up here, we're not. <laughs> So, I think, Sally, would you mind sharing? You sort of had a, a counter perspective to that for yourself, and I think there may be others who would fall in line with that too. Yeah, I'm um, emerging out of the coma of young motherhood <laughs> and having kids attached to you all the time, never having a kind of a moment to breathe, a moment to yourself when you're in the grocery store and you just hear people saying, oh, just enjoy every moment. It goes by so fast. And you just get tired of hearing that, knowing that I don't want to enjoy every moment. Not every moment is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, people say that they're, you know, the dishes and the, the things on the counter, they're small stuff. But when you're when you're in it, in the moment, it's not small, it's big, because you feel chaotic, it feels out of control. So my perspective is that if I can give myself a few minutes to get things under control in my house, it makes me a better mom. And um, if I, sometimes I even set a timer, I say, okay, it's 10 minutes, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes and I'm gonna th throw the things in the dishwasher, put a load of laundry in, pick up the blocks, even though I know they're gonna be there in five more minutes, and just feel, in control, it helps me to be a better mom. And I think that's okay. I think you have to find a balance. That doesn't, doesn't count for young women either. That, it's for older women and how, how our house is. And um, there's a, a single mom that writes books. Her name's Angela Thomas. And she says that she learned that she had to reach the level of what kept her from being not nice. And there are things in my house that if, like, if they leave the dishes on the cabinet when they're perfectly old enough and capable of picking up, I can be not nice. So I think you have to communicate with your family the things that put you over the edge and realize those yourself and keep it nice. Uh, a side note, guys, that's not just for the kids. I think that was for us. <laughs> I could be wrong, but... Hint, hint, hint. Um, okay, let's, let's go with the different perspectives of raising our kids, and, and we have some with older kids in those teenage years or, or older, and we have some who are dealing with the, the times when you're in the grocery store and you just soon check them out when you're checking out. 
Uh, but how are you intentional? Let, let me get in two different questions you can answer to whichever relates most to, your, to your, where you're at in the spectrum of the journey. Um, but for those of you with young children, how have you found ways to be intentional about building that relationship and those, the, the time in with your kids? And for those of you that have the older kids, how are you being intentional about letting them go, even though that's hard? So from whichever spectrum fits where you're at in life, if a couple of you could answer that, that would be great. For me, as the uh, parent of adult children, it's, it's difficult sometimes. Those of you who have adult children know. They, you don't stop being a mother. You don't stop caring. They stay tied to your heart forever. And when the doctor first handed me those babies, I painted a picture in my mind of how I wanted their life to be. And I don't think God got that memo. <laughs> Because there have been things that my children have had to go through that I never would have asked God to put on them. Hmm. And so learning the balance between being a controlling, interfering mom, because I'm in recovery for those things too. <laughs> learning to be balance that with being there when they just need to cry is, is a real, it's a daily trick to do as a mom. How to let go, but still hold on. That's good. My son's a junior, and he's in the process of looking at different colleges, and um, it's a little overwhelming of, you know, what, but I want it to come from him and what his decision is, and um, but yet still help him kind of help be there for him, and I just told him to trust God in the whole process with um, college and just being overwhelmed and just um, giving it to God, and <clears throat> so that's where we're at right now. I think that we're very much at a crossroad with the ages that our girls are at, and as, you know, I love what Pam said, you, you're, you're always going to be their mom, um, but it's figuring out that balance between allowing them to discover their own uh, wings, if you will, and figuring out when to control and when to empower and um, it's, it's been kind of a fun journey at times, and other times it's just like I, I, I bear that burden. I bear that um, being, wanting to be in control. And so just empowering them with their own choices. And, you know, we talk about all the time, you know, we shoo them out the house with that life is about choices. Obviously, we want you to make the good choices, but we're going to love you through the bad and in learning from those but uh, it's just been kind of a, a neat little, I don't know if neat's the right word, but interesting um, segue into where we're at with the girls. I was gonna say, um, for me, you know, Alex is only three, so it's, I haven't gotten to that point, but just making the moments count. I, like I said, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to stay at home with him uh, during the week and, uh, so just spending time with him and kind of with the other one, I, I go to the opposite spectrum where I, I kind of probably spend too much time with him <laughs> because we went through a lot of struggles with uh, fertility and everything. So we, ha we wanted a child for so long when we got him. Um, I mean, he just became like everything. And um, so it's just being intentional now to like, teach him different things and be with him and, and starting to, you know, that relationship, cultivating that relationship that he can ask us anything and um, we'll always be there and just building that foundation of trust with him so that when they do get older, you know, when we face those, those situations, hopefully it'll come back around. One of the most important choices that when we think of our kids that we want them to make and, and embrace is to follow Jesus. So how, how, have you, um, <clears throat> how have you engaged in those kind of conversations with your kids? Because obviously you've got kids at, all over the spectrum with age. How have you been able to talk with them about faith and maybe just give us some thoughts on, on how that went or, or good or bad? Well, again, I want to give a shout out to VNC and the children's staff, all the way from the nursery, all the way to the youth department, Mike. Um, just 
helping, um, it's kind of been like a, a, a family and a, just a positive um, male role models and um, for um, my kids, just reinforcing what I'm trying to teach at home because sometimes, you know, just making sure, oh, you know, did I, did I teach that? Did I get that? But when they come here, they get to hear it again and just um, those relationships here and just helping them um, hear it again and again and again. And I just so appreciate that. And also I think um, the opportunities they give them with the youth um, and also the family opportunities that VNC has with um, the concerts and things like that. If we can't take a vacation, um, just take that, that time is so precious with those concerts because it's like a vacation to us. Um, so I just appreciate the, all the opportunities that VNC gives um, to help families. I will add on to what Kathy's saying with a different perspective. My husband and I are both on staff here, and so our kids are here a lot. And um, as a mom, it can make you a little bit nervous if they're here too much or, you know, if they're going to get a bad view of church or they're going to think their mom and dad are here too much. But um, our kids are at the formative ages of knowing Jesus, and right now, they love coming to church. It's like a celebration every time we get in the car, and they're here a lot, so that's saying a lot. Um, but they love it. They think it's fun. And when they run through the hallways acting like crazy people, you know, you as the church are there calling them by name, giving them high fives, asking for hugs, and embracing them. And as a mom, that means everything to me because they, they love it here, and they think church is fun, which I think translates into them thinking that Jesus is pretty fun and pretty awesome and that someday they're going to equate all of this into a lasting, meaningful relationship with the Lord. And so thank you for, for being my kids' cheerleaders and for walking alongside of them in this journey, just like, you know, Pastor Tanner was, was talking about when he, we just dedicated all those children to the Lord. It, it's important. You guys are important in, in a mom's journey with their children. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it's taking the opportunities where your kids ask questions about God and have an opportunity to see God for real in their life. Um, and something that happened really cool with our son a couple of weeks ago, the 11-year-old, was he had given some money away, which was a really cool thing for us to watch as parents, but um, he had also been saving money for something he really wanted. And when he was ready, you know, saving up and kind of kept watching it, and he came to us one night and he said, Mom, that um, race car that I wanted is on sale. And I thought he's, it was exactly the sale price of what he had given away. And Peter and I were like, just looked at each other and we're like, Grant, do you see that God did that? And so I think letting our kids see real examples in their life of Christ um, is what makes them grow up to just keep seeing it in the everyday things, even a race car that seems not really like God would be in that. <laughs> Um, but for Grant, it was a really cool example of Christ being real in his life. I think that um, I know that there are no guarantees. Um, Bob and I raised three children, two girls and a boy. We took them to church together. We took them to Sunday school together. We read the same Bible stories to all three of them. Um, my daughters are following the Lord, seeking after him every day, raising their children to love Jesus, and our son is not. And there's not a thing I can do about that, that I haven't already done, haven't already tried. Um, he was baptized at 16, was very active in our youth group in Phoenix and was baptized, but when he came back and went to college, he never will deny Jesus, but that, um, that philosophy of tolerance now, he's embraced that. And he says that we are intolerant to think that Christ is the only way. And yet scripture says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So out of my nine beautiful grandchildren, only seven of them are being raised to love Jesus. And the other two, it hurts my heart. And so what we can do is, as parents is never give up. No, when Jay was a little boy on his dresser, he was a difficult child. He was my strong-willed child. 
And I bought a little plaque, and it says, Be patient, God's not done with me yet. I wish I'd have kept it, because God's not done with Jay yet. And until my last breath, I will pray. But as parents, it grieves your heart, and there is not anything you can do, because God gives our kids, as he gave us, free choice. That's the way God works, free choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I come from, or have been very blessed to uh, be raised in a Christian home with uh, godly mom and dad, and I, to this day, thank them for the faith that they have grounded us with. Um, but as I was growing up, I really, as I reflect back on my my um, growing up years, I recognize that mom and dad actually hid a lot from us as kids. Um, they, you know, and they wanted out of, they just wanted the best for us, and I appreciate that, but I never really got to see my mom or dad struggle and see where their faith kind of came to a crossroad. Um, so now that I'm a parent and trying to walk this out with my teenage daughters, um, we have... Uh, in the recent years have just really hit a rough patch. And, you know, our faith has been tested. And um, we, we live in a, a home where we're constantly talking, Jesus, God, God, Jesus, and how good he is. And, you know, we're trying to preach this to the people in and out of our home and our circle um, here at church as well. But what happens when it gets hard? Um, it's been an interesting journey with, with our girls to process through that with them, that life is not always easy, faith isn't always easy, and um, you know, we, when we knew that things were, are, were gonna be difficult for our family, you know, Keith had said, you know, we, we're gonna make a choice to walk this with our hearts broken and not our hearts hard, and as well, we're going to walk this out together. And so that meant being transparent and vulnerable with each other. And as a parent, I know there's a lot of you in the room that can really relate, but that's hard. That's hard to show weakness in front of your kids. Um, but through our pain, I believe that God is continuing to show it to us as a blessing and to be able to use this experience to show our girls the deepest level of dependency that we can have on our Lord. Um, to, and to say that he is true to his word, that he is faithful. Um, and so, you know, walking this road um, of vulnerability and hurt and pain has brought out about a lot, of, uh, a lot of lessons for us as parents and obviously lessons for our kids as well um, to just kind of lay bare before each other and to recognize that God rec or recognize that God is in our pain as much as he is in our joy. I think you heard that nobody gave you some magic formula there. Um, but what they gave you was the reality of man when you're walking out your faith with someone, with your family, with your children. Um, that doesn't put you eight steps ahead. Often that means you're walking shoulder to shoulder and you're gently leading the way. Uh, let me, let, let's stay in that sort of realm of thought. And let me ask a question. Maybe just have a couple of you answer, but what do you do when you're, you're trying to help your child grow and, and learn more about the faith and they start asking questions about the past and decisions you made? Um, what is the wisdom to put into play or maybe you've experienced of how much do I let my kids know about my own mistakes along the way of, of discovering uh, what it is to, to live out my faith? I think I can start on that one. Um, I live, my husband and I live in a home of restoration um, where God has really worked on our marriage in a big way. Um, and I could probably spend the whole 40 minutes talking about that, but um, there is restoration in our home, there's recovery in our home, and... Um, the conversation that we have with our kids looks a lot different than what a lot of other people have with their kids. And so we operate on the philosophy, there's no question off the table, because if we don't answer it, someone else will. Um, and it may not be um, biblical, it may not be scriptural, and it may not be truthful. 
And so um, we constantly reiterate that to our children, especially our 11-year-old, as next year he goes to middle school and probably I'll blink and then we're gonna be in high school and um, the temptations and the things that kids are faced with today looks way different than what most of us looked at. Um, and so I think it is, there's nothing off the table with our kids and it doesn't mean it's not a difficult or uncomfortable conversation, um, but I think it's really important that they know the road we've walked. Um, and I love what you said, Keith, about walking shoulder to shoulder. And there are days where there's brokenness and sometimes it's not opening the Bible, it's just putting it out <laughs> um, because you're just too broken to even read it. But um, I think that our kids have seen us try and really show them our heart and let them see we are not perfect and we sin, um, but we also have grace um, from our Savior. And that's really the, the focus with our kids in our home so that they can see that and know that it, it's going to happen. I mean, we try and get in the way of, at least I do, I want to I wanna ward off that bad stuff that is going to get in my kids' lives, but I know I can't do that because they have to have their own journey. Um, but if I can be real about mine, it might help them a little bit along the way. I think um, for me, my son um, has seen, um, I think it's a life lesson for him knowing that um, he is, he's learned that he wants to be, when he gets older and has kids of his own, he wants to be there for his kids and, um, and um, not make that same mistake that his father had made. And so it's, we're kind of living it. Um, and, um, but they also know that they always have a heavenly father that will always be there, even though their earthly father is not there um, for them. Um, but I think it, just having that conversation and he knows um, and the girls too, you know, know that it's a commitment that you make um, when you get married for, for life. Um, and so they've kind of learned from, you know, whatever happened to us, they've learned from that. Yeah. Well, uh, at some point when the journey's over and, and y'all are 39, um, <laughs> when you reach the end of the journey and you look back on life, Hey, I was trying to be helpful. <laughs> what do you want your kids to remember or think back or, or just embrace from your parenting and your home? I mean, if, yeah, when it's all said and done, what do you want them to look back and go, this is what stuck out to me the most? Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag cherishing presence. Um, I want them to know that I want them. There's a, something floating around Facebook right now that I mean, I think I could have wrote it myself, but uh, they matter, their presence matters. In my home, in my life, I value them uh, so much so. And I also want to you know, leave, I guess, a legacy of, we overuse the words transparency and authenticity but, um, you know, if I was going to have a tattoo, I think that would be it. Um, not that I'm saying that I would. Don't tell your mom. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I hope that they are able to um, glean from, you know, the way that we've chosen to parent uh, is to walk out this life with authenticity and uh, transparency in a way that it draws people in, you know, that they recognize that, you know, life isn't always a bed of roses. It can be, too. I mean, we've... We definitely have our good times and our fun, and our fun. But I think if if I want want to leave that legacy of just cherishing presence. Good. One of the first verses I memorized was, "As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." And um, during one of our discussions with our sons, with our son, he he looked at Bob and I, and he said, "You are the most sincere people I know for your faith." There is no hypocrisy in you. I want you to understand that you have demonstrated faith in God in a way that has been a good example to me. There is no hypocrisy. That, that blesses my heart. And then also to know that without a doubt, each one of our children 
even the one who has chosen a different way, is absolutely loved unconditionally. They have a home with us. We are their home. We are their family, no matter what. And the third thing is that Bob and I are together, just like this, on everything. We stand firm. We stand firm with Jesus so that we can give them the very best example that we can. That's our legacy to them. As for me and my house, together with my husband, we serve the Lord. When my sister graduated from college, um, she immediately went to Argentina and lived there for four years to teach. And um, I remember people coming up to my dad and saying things like, oh, I don't know how you could let her go. You know, if it was my kid, I'd never let them move that far away. And my dad always came back with the same answer. And he said, um, how could I raise her to be independent and to trust God's plan for her life if I can only keep her close enough where I can still hold on to her? And I thought about that many, many times since, and that's what I want my kids to know, that I trust God enough to let them go, and I know that I'm a young mom, that my oldest is only in second grade, and so I know some of you are facing that looming over you right now. Well, how can you say that, you know, you have an eight-year-old, um, my kid's about to leave, you know, in three months, they're going to college, but I think it starts early, setting that foundation of letting them go um, a little bit at a time and showing your trust in God to them so that they feel confident to trust God when he asks them to do something big. And so I really just want to instill that foundation in them. I want them to remember that we had a good time too. You know, that we really laughed, that we had fun. I don't, I don't want my kids to think, oh, my parents love Jesus. What a trip that was. You know, <laughs> I want them to know. We laugh. We have a good time at home. I want them to know that we have fun. I was going to say, for me, um, family is huge. I'm very, very, I'm kind of a homebody, and I, I love my family, and it's the most important thing. So, I want them to know and remember just how much they were loved and accepted and um, just how, how important family relationships are. And of course, you know, God and relying on God for everything because Brian and I have gone through a lot in our life and our marriage and have had some really dark places, um, but just that God's always been there. And he's always loved us through everything. And so we want to instill that in them as well, that, that you can't, you, you can run away from God, but God's never going to run away from you. And um, I'm living proof of that. And uh, so just, just completely relying on God for everything and family and, and church. Just, I grew up in the church. My parents have gone here forever. And um, <laughs> and so I, I want them to also remember the good times that they've had at church. And, and I will say that there's always a party at the White House. I love what you said, Pam, that we do, we strive to have an open door policy. Uh, our house is always open. And that's one of the things that hopefully their, their door will be open to us when we're <laughs> needing it. Um, so maybe we are inadvertently laying that foundation. I think you've put in a request as to what your, your uh, quarters will look like. Um, <laughs> but I think that if I could brag on him for a second, that um, you know, we operate in such a way of wanting to make sure that our girls know how to love. And, and, it, and it doesn't have any boundaries. I don't care color of skin or uh, we could go and list off a whole, you know, w whether it's, you know, you've made these bad choices or great choices or whatever. You're always welcome in our home. And whether it's 1, 10, or 20, you know, that is definitely a legacy <laughs> that we will leave is that they have, they operate with, a village. They operate with a, a ginormous community that surrounds them, and it's not just a 
not just us. Maybe they're thankful for that. I don't know. Just don't come over this afternoon. Um, okay. She don't care. Hey, um, uh, thank you all for your authenticity. Thanks for just letting us view into your lives as a mom. And um, yeah, sort of speaking from that raw level of where you're at. I want to finish our, our time together with some words to um, moms in the room, uh, words to those who, well, you may not be a mom, but you need to understand that you may be a spiritual mom or uh, a mentoring mom to someone else in here today. I also, um, well, I, I read these words as much as I bash social media at the beginning. Uh, these are from a friend of mine who posted a poem and that I want to share with you right now on social media. So listen to these words, moms and and women who are with us today. Uh, To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experienced loss this year through a miscarriage, a failed adoption, or a child running away, we, we mourn and hurt with you. To those who have spent decades regretting a decision, we show you grace and we show you open arms that forgive as God has forgiven all of us. And we love you. We mean that. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes and prods and tears and disappointments, we walk with you. And would you forgive us when we say foolish things? We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and closer relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointments and heartaches and distance with your children, we sit with you today. To those who lost their mother this year, we grieve with you. To those who have experienced abuse at the hand of your own mother, We acknowledge that experience today. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and all overall testing of your motherhood, we're better for having you here today. To those who will have empty nest this coming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. (laughs) To those who are pregnant right now with new life, whether it was expected or a surprise, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, with all of you, we will walk. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. So today, we honor you all, but we also remind you to find your identity in Jesus, even before you find your identity in being a mom.